Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, webinar. Uh, today we have an uh, extended panel with uh, the majority of the people who contribute to the position statement of the management of the adolescent and young adult trans people. Uh, before we will start with the webinar, I would like to uh, welcome everybody, and we are very happy to see so many people that continuously joining us and registered to this webinar. And I would like to give the turn to our president, Carlo Betocci. Carlo? Uh, thank you, and uh, good evening, everybody. I think it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to really listen to all of you and anyway, to be together with you. I think that uh, this, uh, this initiative that is uh, getting better and better every time we continue to do it because we're always more people attending our webinars, I think it's a good way to stay together. And uh, today I'm personally very, very interested to this, uh, to this webinar because uh, this is really part of my initial uh, history on uh, andrology. And so I really uh, very, very much uh, interested in this uh, transgender uh, uh, field and so I think that it will be really one hour that we will enjoy together with uh, such expert people but uh, uh, I want to just give you two minutes about uh, what we are doing as uh, educational with ESSM in this uh, COVID uh, year so I don't know if Daniela can move on with the next slides first of all you are already uh, aware about these webinars and uh, uh, the webinars uh, has been organized by both uh, uh, Jacob Reisman and Giovanni Corona. And so I think that we have uh, a good number of uh, appointments that you can really join very easily and possibly a good time in your day. <clears throat> but uh, um, if we go on the next slide, uh, Daniela, I would like to remember you that some other educational uh, activities are running. And uh, first of all, about our publications, uh, we have already uh, published since 2012 our manual of sexual medicine that we update in 2015. And uh, there are, oh, is available on the uh, website for the ESM members, as well as the syllabus on clinical sexology that was done in 2013 and is also available for ESM members on the website. We are already uh, uh, on the market uh, with the textbook uh, on uh, surgery and everything is ready. So I think that probably next month it will be really uh, available. And so I think that this is a, a good part of uh, information and knowledge that you can take from our society. But uh, if we move on the next one, just the last information about uh, the incoming Academy on, Sur on Genital Surgery that is uh, ready and will start in 2021. And this will be a very good piece of uh, learning and hands-on training program that we have uh, established in uh, different, uh, with uh, also fellowship in different uh, European excellence centers. And so I think everybody's interested in surgery. I think this is a good moment to be attached to us. And uh, finally, uh, we also are promoting very much our videos. Uh, already we have videos on uh, knowledge of erectile dysfunction, uh, but uh, we are increasing our library with some other videos, uh, not only uh, on, uh, uh, on the knowledge meant about uh, sexual dysfunction, but also on surgery. And so again, uh, try to be a member of our society because we have a lot of advantages. And I think that uh, we are happy to share this experience with all of you. So uh, I think uh, this is all. I think this is my last, last slide, if I'm not wrong. Yes. And so thank you very much and uh, enjoy this uh, nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Carlo. Uh, and before we start also to our scientific, we move to our scientific chair, uh, Giovanni Corona, who contributed a lot for the organization of those uh, the statements and these activities. Giovanni? Giovanni, your microphone is uh, mute. No, let me see. Now you're okay. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay, so I'm really proud about this project that was started almost three years ago, uh, along with Kobe and then with Carlo. Uh, now we have uh, very good results. Uh, all of uh, the uh, first wave of uh, statement are now uh, already published. Uh, 
uh, we are also working on a second wave of statement. Uh, as endocrinology, I think that uh, the uh, issue of this uh, uh, statement related to the uh, endocrinology uh, approach to transgender people is one of the most uh, challenging issue. Um, uh, so I'm really, really uh, proud about these results. Uh, and uh, it would be a fantastic uh, uh, night. I'm sure that one of the most important topics covered by this statement is related to the approach of uh, adolescents uh, with uh, uh, these kinds of problems. So uh, please enjoy uh, this uh, fantastic webinar initiative and so uh, enjoy it and uh, go ahead, Kobe. Thank you so much, uh, Giovanni. It's a really great pleasure to, to be with so many people and with such an excellent uh, um, uh, panel. Uh, we are very pleased with it. Uh, I will give soon the, uh, the stage to the panel and uh, they will uh, introduce themselves. These are the most experienced and uh, knowledge people on uh, this uh, subject. So I'm very proud that they are with us and with uh, all of you uh, this evening. Remember that you are able to uh, chat with each other to, through the chat and you have the Q&A uh, button on your screen when you can ask questions. We will not uh, answer the questions immediately. At the end of the presentation, there will be ability to answer the questions. So uh, write them on the, on the question and answer a, a screen that you can get and enjoy this uh, webinar and I will move immediately to the presentation of, of, uh, of our expert panel and give the microphone to them. Okay, so good evening everybody and thank you for the introduction. It's indeed our pleasure to present to you uh, the assessment and hormonal management in adolescent and adult trans people. It's a paper that it was published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually. It was online a bit earlier, but a couple of weeks ago, it was also available in print version. And I'm very proud to uh, present you uh, uh, six of the seven authors of this paper. It's exceptional that we can uh, get everybody together this evening at the same time. Uh, there's one who is not available. It's uh, John Arcelus from Nottingham, but he says hi to everybody. But we will definitely cover his part also in this webinar. Um, we're all clinicians. I think that's a very important um, message. We're uh, clinical researchers, so we really talk uh, from experience. And even though we talk from experience, we found it very hard to give you very direct recommendations. And that's why we uh, will give you clinical consensus statements and not very hard recommendations because we base ourselves on clinical experience, but also, of course, as clinical researchers on the available literature. But the available literature is uh, in transgender health still quite limited. So we wanted to be careful with, with um, giving you direct recommendations. Maybe some of the statements that we will discuss will seem basic to many of you. But I think um, as still many trans people experience um, barriers to care, I think it's important um, to repeat them. In Next slide, Kobe. So we will give you an overview on the up-to-date definitions on the language. As I said, we will give you clinical consensus statements, also discuss the different treatment options. We will cover both adolescents and adults, and it's not only about endocrinology, but it's also on mental health and on assessment. And in the end, there will be also a part on sexuality, and Mr. Oeser, who is also a surgeon, but also a sexologist, will cover this part and she is the leading author of the next um, position, ESSM position statement on surgery uh, specifically and that's being developed as we speak. It's in revision or will be in revision very soon. So this is a uh, part one of um, 
of a two-piece two part on uh, transgender health. Next slide, please. So this is what we will do. Uh, you can see all the authors. You will meet them one by one in this order. And uh, Jos Motwans will start with the general statements. And then the next slide. So Jos is a sociologist also um, working at the Ghent University. Uh, and he will start with a general overview of this topic. Yes, hello everybody. Good evening and thank you for being here. So it's my job to talk you through the first uh, part of the statements, which are more general statements. And as Guy has mentioned, maybe for some of you, they will be common sense, but we noticed that this is definitely not the case in all healthcare services. So we thought it would be worthwhile to repeat it anyhow. Um, the very first statement is that we would advise healthcare providers when working with trans people to recognize the diversity of genders. So not only um, accepting or recognizing male and female genders, but also pay enough attention to the existence of non-binary individuals. Um, throughout the position paper and also throughout our talk tonight, we will use the language of uh, transgender, uh, trans with an asterisk or simply trans. Um, with that language, what we imply is that we would like to take into account so both the people who clearly feel and live uh, as women or men but as well as uh, gender diverse persons who might identify as neither male nor female both as female and male or as something else and they might um, use for themselves identity labels such as non-binary gender queer agender bigender gender fluid and so forth um, when we apply the term uh, trans or the adjective trans, we do not want to imply automatically that these people experience a desire for gender affirming um, medical interventions such as gender affirming hormonal therapy, surgeries or any other medical interventions such as hair removal, speech therapy, etc. But it also does not exclude it. So you might encounter non-binary people in your practice who have a wish for gender affirming hormonal therapy and maybe even for surgery. And choosing surgery does not imply that you are male or female. It also can imply that you can be non-binary. We choose in our um, position paper to use um, the assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth terminology um, because in many um, publications that we were reviewing, it was not always clear if the gender identity of the clients had been assessed at all. Uh, in many cases, it was um, supposedly uh, described like that by the researchers or the clinicians themselves. And to do justice to the diverse um, identity, uh, identities that exist, we decided to, um, and also for especially the hormonal part, we decided to use assigned male at birth and assigned female at birth terminology. Next slide, please. Um, a second statement ties into the first one and uh, is that we advise healthcare providers when they work with trans people to openly ask the um, individual's gender experience who is seeking treatment in your practice uh, including which pronouns and names they would like to be addressed with. Um, and of course, although we have set out that uh, trans can apply non-binary labels and so forth, it is very important to stick with the terminology that the client in front of you is using and be respectful in that regard. And also pay enough attention to the fact that this may change in the future throughout the life course of your uh, clients. Uh, there is research uh, that has shown that um, if healthcare providers and other people's uh, other people's in the surrounding of the trans person is is using the person's chosen name, that this is clearly and significantly associated with lower depression, suicidal ideation, and suicidal behavior. So it's not just a matter of respect; it's also a matter of health. Next slide, please. For those who are not so familiar with language um, in the transgender studies, um, there are some resources that I would like to draw your attention to. The very first one is a very basic level um, guidelines, uh, guidelines published by 
the APA, which are guidelines for talking about gender with inclusive, inclusivity and respect. Um, I think they are very detailed and very clear. And of course, there are also other um, interesting articles that have been published and where we were heavily involved, such as the language and trans health a paper, uh, which was published in the International Journal of Transgenderism. And then of course, also the upcoming editorial in the Journal of Sexual Medicine about language and ethics in transgender health. So for those of you who are doubting about how to write and reflect about it, about trans uh, topics, uh, these are good resources. Next slide, please. And then I've grouped together the last three general statements. Um, the first one is that we advise healthcare providers when working with trans people to also critically reflect upon um, discriminatory factors that might influence both the access to a gender related healthcare service, but also the outcomes and to make the necessary changes to accommodate all trans individuals. Um, healthcare providers must be aware that in their everyday lives, trans people often share the experience of social exclusion. Um, there is, of course, in many countries, the possibility to be legally uh, recognized for your gender, but in most cases, this is restricted to male or female options and not uh, a legal option for non-binary people. And a lot of trans people face discrimination and stigmatization. Um, and this has been shown in research that is strongly related to societal ideation. Um, so it's a, it's a very important topic to take into the consultations as well and to also have a look on how your own practice is accommodating trans individuals. And this can be uh, stemming from very practical things such as how are people addressed in their waiting room, how are people addressed at the secretary and so forth. The fourth uh, vision um, um, is that uh, we advise that healthcare providers when working with trans people also critically reflect on their own possible uh, norms and ethics and power positions. Um, it's very important in our opinion that healthcare providers also reflect on their own understanding of sex and gender, um, because of course this might um, play a role in your interactions with your clients. And the last general statement is that we advise healthcare providers when you're working with adult trans people to very clearly explain the results of your clinical assessment. Uh, so to reach uh, a shared understanding and a shared responsibility in um, decision making processes. Of course, being respectful to trans people is paramount for any healthcare professional working with this population. Um, and when you are um, working with trans people, understanding the vulnerabil vulnerabilities of some trans people um, may help uh, to develop a client-centered treatment plan. So those were the general statements. Um, and now it's my honor to give the floor to Timo Nieder, who's a psychotherapist and who will talk you through the statements um, for the assessment of adults with a trans identity. So thank you, Joss. Hello from Hamburg in Germany to everyone in this webinar. Thank you for this opportunity. And I realized that there already was some question in the Q and A's. So I will try to address those uh, questions as well. As Guy and Joss already introduced, we have diagnoses um, who are partly trying to cover um, transgender as a term, but who are different from this term transgender or trans. So we have from 2013, the diagnosis of gender dysphoria from the American Psychiatric Association published. And from last year, the new diagnosis of gender incongruence from the World, World Health uh, Organization published 2019. And the central, the central change to this diagnosis compared to the previous diagnosis, which was from the APA is M4, the gender identity disorder, and which was from the WHO ICD-10, the transsexualism, is that in the current diagnosis, there's no 
ref no reference to the opposite sex or the other sex. Next slide, please. So next next step, the central the central aspect next step of the diagnosis of both diagnoses is the incongruence between the gender on the one hand and the sex on the other on the other hand. And gender is referring to the expressed or experienced gender, and it's commonly described as gender identity as well. And the sex is referring to the sex characteristics, primary or secondary sex characteristics. So there's no mentioning of the opposite sex, uh, which was mentioned by the previous diagnoses, and which is still mentioned by the ICD-10 diagnosis of transsexualism, which is a problem. And still, the APA in the USA mentioned for the first time in 2013 that the incongruence between gender and sex is not a matter of pathology, neither a matter of psychopathology at all. So this is just a human variation. But how they justified the integration of this diagnosis in a diagnostic manual for mental disorders was that only in this situation when the gender incongruence results into distress or impairment, clinical distress or impairment. Next step, please. This justifies the clinical significance of the diagnosis and this justifies to name it gender dysphoria. So only when the incongruence between gender and sex results in distress. The gender incongruence diagnosis for, from the ICD-11, next step, makes it a little bit different, but same, same, but different somehow. They still, they still put the incongruence in the center of the diagnosis, but they say that trans people, gender incongruent people, next step, don't necessarily need to suffer from being gender incongruent. So they say, next step, in the center of the diagnosis, next step, it's the clinical significance, next step. So they just say it's the incongruence which justifies the prescription of the diagnosis of gender incongruence so that trans people do not need to suffer to have the diagnosis. But still, as it was with the APA diagnosis of gender dysphoria, the WHO aimed at destigmatizing the population of trans people. And so one could ask, how can they justify to have the variation of being trans or being gender incongruent as a matter of clinical significance? And this is the reason why they invented a new chapter of diagnosis and they removed the gender incongruence diagnosis from the mental health chapter and had uh, developed, next step please, a new diagnosis chapter called conditions related to sexual health. So this is not a mental disorder anymore, next step please. And the gender, uh, the WHO stated that gender incongruence is no longer classified a mental disorder in ICD-11. This should reduce stigma and improve care. And yes, it is a current situation that the WHO, with the global approach of the ICD-11, has, has failed to deal, or it was not the interest of the WHO to, um, to think about the national impact of the diagnosis of gender incongruence. So in countries where the cost reimbursement is still binding to the ICD-10 diagnosis of transsexualism, which is restricted to binary transsexual people in terms of the diagnosis, their healthcare professionals might have some problems. And I could only talk about how we solve this situation in Germany and what I know, know from other 
European countries, but this is currently this is a this could be a problem. Next slide, please. So when it comes to our position statement in terms of diagnosis and assessment, we are referring, of course, we are referring to the uh, DSM-5 diagnosis and the ICD-11 diagnosis to gender dysphoria and to gender incongruence. So we advise that healthcare professionals working with trans people should inform trans adults who seek gender affirming medical interventions of its effects and assess the capacity of the individual to reach an informed consent regarding gender affirming medical interventions. This is very paramount to the work to work and come to an informed consent and before doing this to assess the capacity of the individual to understand what you are doing in your work. So next to this, we advise that in view of the strong evidence regarding the high levels of mental health problems in adults presenting at trans health services, and especially those who are not on hormone treatment yet, healthcare professionals should have expertise in mental health to be able to identify those requiring further support for mental health professionals to allow for the best possible outcome of gender affirming medical interventions. And for this, on the one hand, we need clinical experience because the population of trans people or individuals uh, presenting at trans health services is very diverse. It's very heterogeneous, not only when it comes to gender identities as Joss already introduced us, but also with regard to um, clinical performance with regard to mental health status. So what we recommend next to uh, the clinical expertise to get this, uh, to use some very basic screening instruments, for example, the Beck's depression inventory for effective symptoms or for major depression, um, or an instrument to have some basic psychosis risk screening that for uh, like the prodromal questionnaire in its brief version and some uh, screening instrument for uh, suicidality screening as the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Next slide, please. And I grouped several uh, advices on this slide uh, that we advise that um, healthcare professionals post role in the healthcare system is to inform and to assess the capacity to consent for gender affirming medical interventions in trans people should explore the resilience and the social support to have a focus on what makes the trans person strong in view of the association of resilience and social support with health related quality of life and psychological well-being to so the advice is not to focus only on what is problematic or what is the basis of distress, but to focus on resilience and social support. Healthcare, should, uh, healthcare professionals should inform clients about the effect that gender affirming medical interventions, which is at least both hormones and surgical next to other interventions, may have on sexual health and fertility. And last advice, last recommendation, especially in countries where an assessment process is required, including a clinical diagnosis to access gender affirming medical interventions, we advise that healthcare professionals who are working in this fields have the expertise in basically reaching this required diagnosis, no matter if it's DSM-5 or ICD-11 or even ICD-10 for the health service, because this is a key uh, a key qualification that the trans people who sought seeking treatment is in need of. So I think I'm finished with my slides. So I'm more than happy to introduce now Dr. Annelou de Vries from the very famous Amsterdam team uh, in transgender health care and transgender health care research. Annelou de Vries is a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and we are happy to have you, Annelou, in our group.
Yeah. Can you? Um, so, muted by the host. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm working in Amsterdam for a long time already, and I've seen large changes, especially with regard to uh, the enormous increase in referrals we get, especially of young people. Um, and this experience and the research we are doing has helped me to better understand these young people. And one of the important things, and this is the first recommendations that we made, is that we, sh we advise healthcare professionals working with gender diverse children and adolescents to really support their exploration and expression of the youth experienced gender and help reduce the experience barriers for those seeking care. Um, so our experience still is that a lot of these children experience stigma, shame, and what they really need of us is our support, but also our support in um, having a good relationship with us as healthcare providers uh, in which they can openly explore their gender identities and reflect upon them. And what is also important is that these healthcare professionals take really a developmental approach. And one of the important reasons for that is that what we know of gender identity development from research uh, on pre progression to gender non-conforming children is that not all these children will turn out to be a transgender adolescent or adult. Um, actually, that will only be the minority, depending on which study you look at. And these are all just clinical samples, small samples. So we should also realize that there's a lot of uncertainty when working with um, transgender young people. But only 2 to 39% will be the future transgender adolescents or adults. And the majority will, will turn out to be uh, a cisgender uh, adult, although uh, in, a in a larger percentage with a homosexual sexual orientation. So next slide, please. Um, when working with children and adolescents, another thing we really stress is that healthcare professionals should likewise the adults assess resilience and vulnerability because again we know that this group is a, a vulnerable population um, increased suicide risk depression anxiety but also autism co-occur in gender diverse children and adolescents and it's important to be aware of them and treat them but also be aware of the role of the environment, especially schools and families, because children growing up in a safe and accepting home have far better psychological outcomes than children and adolescents growing up in an environment where they experience what is called sexual minority stress. And that's the stress that results from belonging to a minority and being stigmatized. Um, so when we work with the families, we really stress that the environment is also important. Next slide, please. Um, when working with children and adolescents, and I'm talking about children and adolescents all the time, because we really make a division uh, between prepubescent children and children that are already in puberty or where puberty, physical puberty has started, um, and they, we call them adolescents. And one of the reasons is that when you think about the developmental approach is that the prepubescent child might not be um, uh, fully developed yet in their gender identity. And for example, um, what one of the important concepts they might not yet fully grab yet is that gender is not an, a binary system, but that it, it's a spectrum. And it's a spectrum that contains gender identity, gender expression, the biological sex, but also sexuality and romance. And these are experiences that young children uh, not always have experienced yet. Um, so when a child comes to our clinics, we uh, one of the matters we really discuss is the matter of when a child will social transitioning social transition so we'll live in the experienced gender role 
Um, and if the families de decide to do so, we really um, think it's important to discuss the pros and cons of such a step um, and provide psychological support while taking these steps. Next slides, please. Um, this approach is really different when it comes to adolescence, because once puberty starts, the question is, of course, if a gender affirming medical treatment will be uh, started. Uh, first with the puberty blockers, which is a fully reversible treatment that provides rest and time before more, um, before more permanent decisions are made uh, around hormones and surgical uh, uh, affirming treatment with more long lasting effects. Um, and at that point of time, I think it's really important to work together in a multidisciplinary team um, and realize that a lot of these adolescents are really helped by puberty suppression and further affirming treatments. And what you see here in this uh, slide below is that, um, yes, they improve in general functioning, their psychological functioning um, improves, so emotional and behavioral problems decrease, and especially gender dysphoria is really resolved by gender affirming medical interventions also in young people. Um, so um, this is my sort of introduction for the adolescents. Um, and I want to really uh, continue with the next speaker. And I have forgotten who is the next one. Um, so maybe <laughs> next slide. Then I know. <laughs> Here, this is Guy Chu. Now, this is Alessandra Fischer. She will talk about hormone therapy. She is an uh, acknowledged endocrinologist in Florence of Italy. Okay, I have to correct you, Anna Lou. It's my. Oh, you're going to do it. So, again, uh, <laughs> we're going to start with the assigned female at birth persons, and then Alessandra, after me, will uh, do the other group. So, we have. Uh, six statements specifically on hormone treatment in assigned female at birth persons. And the first one is indeed about the adolescents and when, they show, when they show their first pubertal changes and that's standard stage genital two, and also have a sufficient capacity to give informed consent. Then we may advise pubertal hormone suppression. Of course, if that's available and if that's allowed in your country. We do realize there, that there may still be interfering psychosocial difficulties, but they should be addressed, but they should not be a reason uh, to not initiate uh, GnRH analog treatment. So pubertal hormone suppression is often performed with GnRH analogs, as um, a well-known Amsterdam protocol has advised us to do, and since uh, that paper was published, no better solutions have been offered in the literature so far. So the next statement is that, um, that we advise in adolescents who desire masculinizing hormone treatment, that we will induce puberty with testosterone. Also here, them, there may be a legal um, argument playing. It depends on the situation in your country to know what is possible, but in adolescents, and late adolescents, we will usually start with 75 milligrams of testosterone intramuscular every two weeks. So that's a step up program. And we will reach a maintenance dose at about six months. And during that period, the GnRH analogs are continued. And we usually continue these until gonadectomy. In a later adolescent, if it's especially suppression of menstruation that is desired, we can also work with a progestational agent. The third uh, statement here is that we advise that before the initiation of GnRH analogs or progestogens or testosterone, that we should screen for conditions that may worsen with the start of treatment. And I think we need to move one or two slides now because I've, yes, one more. And I've listed one more. I know that, set one, sorry. So you see the, the reasons why we, what we are looking for as an internal medicine specialist is to find those patients 
who may have polycythemia because testosterone treatment will in, induce that even further. We want to look for uh, also sleep apnea, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and untreated arterial hypertension. If these conditions occur, we have to be careful and we have to find a solution or treat these conditions first before we can offer any hormonal treatment. And sometimes we have to talk to our colleagues in hematology if a coagulation problems arise to see what is possible. There are two absolute contraindications for testosterone treatment, and that is pregnancy, of course, or desired pregnancy, and also lactation. Here in this schedule, in this table, you can see all the different um, possibilities of hormone treatment. So you have intramuscular uh, testosterone treatment, sometimes also in the literature found as subcutaneous uh, treatments, but you also have transdermal and oral testosterone. And uh, the second part are the pro progestational agents. And it really depends on what is available in your country, but the goal is sterilization. So it doesn't really matter what you use. There are a lot of possibilities. So you can go back now one slide. So we have a fourth statement, meaning that um, if masculinization is desired, you want uh, to advise testosterone treatment, which is the basis for this, of course. And we want to monitor serum sex, um, sex steroid levels and also signs of virilization. And usually uh, we will uh, want to reach cisgender testosterone levels and especially if ophorectomy would be performed in the future, the testosterone treatment will be lifelong, uh, especially to avoid symptoms of uh, hypogonadism and also osteoporosis and the vasomotor symptoms. Um, we will see uh, those clients, those patients, usually, usually every three to four months in the, in the first year and then twice a year at the endocrine department in the second year and after that once a year. The fifth statement is to discuss uh, the effects and also possible adverse health effects of the hormone treatments, including fertility preservation options. So you can move again uh, one slide, please. And you see there on the right, the uh, fertility options and those are preserved oocytes or even ovarian tissue or even embryos before hormone treatment. And we want to stress especially that for, uh, fertility um, questions should be answered by preference before testosterone treatment is started because we will have a lot of emotional difficult difficulties probably when we have to interrupt testosterone treatment to preserve these germ cells. You can move one slide and here you see all, uh, no, uh, go further. So yes, here you see all the masculinizing effects of uh, testosterone treatment. They're quite obvious and you can find nice reviews here, but of course you will have a lowering of the voice, interruption of menses if they're still present. There will be an appearance of a male pattern uh, facial and body hair. Also some clitoral growth has been described by the next speaker. She described in her study an increase of uh, the clitoral length up to three centimeters. There's also an increased prevalence and severity of acne and an increased muscle mass and decreased fat mass. Of course there will also be a vaginal and cervical atrophy which can induce vaginal dryness and also itching and painful penetration for which we advise over-the-counter lubricants that may prove to be helpful. Always as an internal medicine specialist, we think about the uh, person that is in front of you, what body parts are still there and if cervical tissue is still present or if a mastectomy has not been performed yet, we should uh, always monitor uh, or we recommend monitoring uh, as in cisgender women. So we will go back uh, one slide and another one. And then the last advice is specifically on sexual function, sexual desire and activity 
be acknowledging that the literature on sexual functioning in um, assigned female at birth or trans men is quite scarce. It cannot be generalized because there's quite a diversity within this group and there are many variables that will play a role. A role as uh, will the person have testosterone treatment? What has happened uh, um, on a surgical basis? Uh, is there a partner uh, available? What are the mental health issues? We know from our own research that sexual desire will increase, especially in the first phase, in the first year of testosterone treatment, and will then gradually come back to baseline. So this is a very brief summary on the endocrine part on testosterone treatment. So we move now to Italy, to the University of Florence, where Alessandra Fischer works, and she will discuss everything on the assigned male at birth trans persons. Thanks, Guy, and good afternoon, everybody. So now let's start with the assigned male at birth trans persons. If desired, adolescents assigned birth trans person can start uh, generic analogs uh, when they reach down stage two, which is represented by a testis volume larger than four milliliter, which is the time exactly when uh, usually the distress uh, start growing. And when also uh, they have a sufficient capacity to give an informed consent. So please, next slide. Okay. Assigned male, at birth, male adolescent can also start uh, uh, feminizing hormone treatment uh, by using estradiol. And this is, should be usually done uh, with gradually increasing schedule in order to um, to, 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 to replicate the normal timing of the puberty. And during this treatment also, a generic analog should be continued in order to suppress fully the uh, hypothalamus gondal axis. So please, the next one. Before starting the treatment with genetic analogs or with anti-androgen and estrogens in an adult uh, assigned male at birth, the hormone prescribing physician needs also to screen all the conditions that can be worsened with the start of treatment, such as pre-embolic diseases, breast cancers, macroprolactinoma, coronary artery diseases, cerebrovascular disease, cholelithiasis, and hypertriglyceridemia. So please, next one. So if assignment at birth trans people desire feminization, uh, we can use estrogens and antiandrogens uh, with the aim to obtain physiological levels of tradial for a perimenopausal women. Uh, as, we, and as you can see uh, from this table, we have a different kind of estrogen that can be used. And among the antiandrogens, the most used in Europe is represented by saproton acetate, which is a progestin having an antiandrogenic property. So please, the next one. So estrogen and antiandrogens have uh, many effects in feminalizing uh, the body, such as re significant reduction in uh, hair distribution, so an increase in, uh, in uh, skin soften and a decrease in sebum and actin, and also a distribution of uh, body fat in a more female way. But the most studied effect uh, induced by estrogen is represented by breast growth. Please, the next slide. Next, okay, thanks. Uh, which uh, is uh, increased significantly over two years of treatment. However, as you can see, less than 20% of uh, assignment at birth trans people reach a tunnel stage four and five after two years treatment. And this is the reason why 
most of them sick mammoplastic, even after hormone treatment. So please, the next one. Also, the adverse effect should be uh, taken into account when hormone treatment is prescribed. So uh, should be carefully discussed with patient and uh, treated. And among these, we should also always consider also fertility preservation, such as sperm preservation, surgical sperm extraction, testicular tissue care preservation before starting hormone treatment. Please, the next one. So finally, uh, it's really important to share with the patient that hormone treatment, feminalizing hormone treatment can have an effect on sexuality. In fact, this treatment induces a significant decrease in sexual desire, but also spontaneous erection or erectile dysfunction, which are often desired by patients, but not always. But despite uh, this effect on sexual desire, studies have reported a better subjective perception of sexuality, as well as a reduction in, of body uneasiness and also reduction of sexual distress. Anyway, all these possible consequences on sexuality uh, should be taken into account, discussed with the patient and also uh, with the partner if the patient has one. So I will leave uh, the next slides to uh, Dr. Muje Odzer from Amsterdam, plastic surgeon. Yes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Last part of this position statement is uh, about surg uh, surgical treatments and the statement we have for this, uh, st four statements we have here, I will go through with you. Uh, it's important to know that the surgical options for trans people are merely introduced in this paper and should be included in the follow-up paper. And that is reviewed at this moment. Um, uh, and it will be a paper on uh, assess position statement on sexual... Sorry. Sorry for that. Um, uh, our next position statement that will be on sexual well-being and gender affirming surgery. For us, we advise healthcare professionals to be aware of potential sexual problems during the all surgical phases of treatment, but also on the hormonal uh, uh, phases, and that will be elaborated further on in this presentation. We also advise that the, regardless of the surgical pathway, healthcare professional must be aware. Uh, or stay aware of the diversity in sexual practices of trans people. Oh, this is going really fast. Can we go back a few slides? Uh, one more, please. Yeah. Um, because not all trans individuals end up in uh, heteronormative sexual intercourse. Further on, we advise surgeons performing gender-affirming surgery to collaborate with sex, uh, sexologists experience, experienced and knowledge about trans people. Next slide, please. When it comes to um, sexual well-being after gender-affirming surgery, we see that most uh, overall results lean to forward, uh, towards favorable sexual outcomes. Um, it, with most post-surgical trans AMAP, we see satisfi satisfaction with their sexual life after surgery. And also with um, um, AFAP after methadioplasty, we see that they are 100% satisfied with their sexual function and aesthetic outcomes, also up to 100%. And they don't have problems with sexual arousal, masturbation, or uh, orgasm at all. All um, studied uh, patients have had an orgasm. When it comes to trans men with a phalloplasty, we see sexual activity was higher. Uh, this is involves sex with partner and also masturbation, a more free, uh, high, frequent use of genitals during sex than before surgery. And also sexual expectations were most, uh, more frequently met with an erectile prothesis, although 
most men also endured pain after uh, uh, an act, uh, erectile prothesis when they have penetrative sex. Next slide, please. Although um, we, the most uh, outcomes seem favorable, it's really important to know that trans people may or may not follow a, a standard linear progression towards hormones and then surgical procedures. So it's possible that people don't use hormones or, and want surgery or don't have surgery at all, although they identify as trans. Um, because of the problems people can have after surgery or, during, uh, uh, or just before surgery, uh, collaboration with a urology is, a urologist is advised because of uh, avoiding problems that can occur. Also, a pelvic physiotherapist um, uh, could be um, contacted because of avoiding problems or accessibility problems of the near vagina for dilatation or sexual contact. And of course, um, a sexology a sexologist should be contacted uh, because of the when they have experience because of all. Uh, in all phases, they can occur problems. Um, and um, uh, sexual problems mainly also are based on psychosexual education or guidance that is lacking, sexual experience of the patient that is lacking before they enter uh, um, the gender uh, treatment, and also knowledge with both of the patients and the healthcare professionals. Sexual outcomes that are reported are mostly post-surgical. So other phases, so pre-treatment and hormone treatment are really lacking when it comes to research. And also data, um, although we have found 174 um, papers, data is really limited and heterogeneous. So um, you can't compare the results and the quality is mostly very low because it's either self-developed questionnaires or a telephone interview, but mostly um, chart review, so uh, uh, re retrospective. And also validated tools are missing, and that's also what you see when you go into the research. Uh, we, can, we don't have tools to assess our surgery. So I think the last slide should be for Giles, because this wouldn't have been uh, able to um, come to this position statement without our hero and our, uh, his guidance. So I think, Giles, this is your slide and it's not up to me to tell about the next conferences. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mitchell. Uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for being here. And um, as we are all heavily involved in the European Professional Association for Transgender Health, we of course look forward to meet all of you at our fourth EPOD conference. Our EPOD conferences are growing and growing every time. Um, for the next conference in 2021. We are not quite sure yet how and in what way we will organize it, but we'll definitely organize something. And of course, we always have an EPOT panel or session also at the conferences of the ESSM. So either way, it would be a pleasure to meet all of you in person instead of through these screens. So I think that was um, our presentation. Thanks to my colleagues for the collaboration. And I guess um, if time is not up yet, we can still have a look at the Q&A. Thank you everyone for a wonderful presentation and uh, uh, excellent uh, slides and making it so um, uh, easy to understand with all the different terms uh, that running around and you know it better than I have uh, that a lot of people uh, confuse uh, a lot of things uh, nowadays. Uh, there are uh, some questions and if possible, uh, please uh, put your microphone on the one who wants to answer and I will go uh, through them. One is what information you provide to parents and uh, guardians of transgender adolescents when it comes to possible adverse effects of uh, GNRHA? I think it's for the endocrinologist among you. Guy or Alexander? Do you hear me? Yes, well, there's still quite uh, very little information about um, adverse events of GNRH, on, uh, especially it? on bone density. Okay. Uh, so, so far, I mean, it's the only treatment which is available. If you want to do puberty blocking, I mean, that will be the way to go. And everybody, especially also our uh, pediatric 
endocrinologists, colleagues acknowledge that a lot of um, a lot is to be learned about uh, the general health uh, impact on those adolescents. But so far from those people who have been studied, the results are quite reassuring. I mean, people are in quite good health. Uh, there are not large side effects to be mentioned, except maybe for bone density. There is a worry about bone density when over puberty, you don't, do not have the uh, induction of uh, bone mass uh, because of the sex steroid hormones, uh, but it's definitely uh, something that has to be looked at that can be um, treated also. But of course, if you did not block your puberty, you have many other difficulties. So um, from the available data, which is indeed limited, we have to acknowledge that uh, GnRH of puberty blocking and then uh, the desired hormone treatment is quite safe. Thank you, Guy. There is a, a question from John Dean who writes, comparing the safety profile of uh, ciproterone with G GnRH uh, analogs, can we justify continue to prescribe uh, ciproterone? Yes, maybe Alessandra, I want to answer this question as well. Uh, but I mean, yes, uh, Sarpotron acetate has. Uh, if you want to answer. I'll go ahead, yes. Yeah. So indeed, Sarpotron. This is a really good question, thank you. Um, it, yes, good point. However, we also we still have some uh, doubt about the effect on mood of Sarpotron acetate as uh, from it suggesting effects, so we don't know if the study we, we have to now are just related to the depression uh, induced by the hypogonadism in patients with uh, prostate cancer, or if this is also a direct effect from a separate OCD. So uh, we should, I think, study better if separate OCD, even if cheaper and uh, so easily prescribed uh, in many countries, uh, it's enough safe. I don't know if you, you want to add, say something more about that. Well, I agree that saprotronacid has uh, gotten a lot of negative reviews uh, since a long time, but not also now recently. The advice that we give is if you if you want to use saprotronacid because maybe GnRH analogs are not available or very expensive, that you would uh, give it only in a low dose, and a low dose would mean about 10 milligrams daily, and not longer than two years of treatment. So for those who would, where you can see that there will be a long term treatment with antiandrogens, we would advise using something else, such as maybe a spironolactone. Um, I think uh, ciprotron acetate, we have used it for many, many, many years without seeing a lot of problems also, especially in the energy study that we conduct. So that you, that's a large prospective study, which has now more than 2,600 participants. We don't, did not really see uh, on the short term uh, many problems. We do not know about the long terms, but my feeling is that indeed there is an increased relative risk with saprotron acetate, especially for development of a meningioma, uh, but still the absolute risk is, uh, is quite, is very, very low. So, I mean, maybe we should not uh, throw saprotron acetate uh, away completely and uh, just uh, choose it for the right patient. And if you don't want to use it, I think spinal lactone is uh, the other option, although it's uh, more difficult to um, suppress your testosterone levels. Thank you, Guy. There is another question that actually, uh, two questions, one from uh, John Dean and one from uh, Arnold um, Mergelen. Uh, concerning uh, achieving pe uh, pregnancy after testosterone treatment by stopping the testosterone or uh, having encounters with a male partner uh, or sperm inoculation. inoculation. Um, and John uh, Dean uh, reply also wrote that although everybody should be offered the uh, option to protect reproductive capacity before hormone therapy, some transmasculine people value testosterone therapy to achieve some body change and relief from dysphoria is usually possible for them to regain reproductive capacity through IVF or pregnancy after a period of treatment with testosterone. This 
uh, should be presented as another option to all patients. Can you comment on that? I will always also take this one and then I will shut up for the rest of the evening. But <laughs> I think it's a, those, those are very good remarks and it's, it's definitely uh, true what uh, John suggests that indeed uh, you can regain uh, fertility when you stop testosterone. Uh, the, um, the issue is often that uh, there are quite some trans men who do not want to stop, who think it's uh, very uh, difficult and emotional to stop testosterone treatment. But for those who are very motivated, it's definitely an option. And our fertility team will then wait until testosterone levels have come down again. And uh, um, the menses, so the ovulation menses will start again. And that will be a sign of low enough testosterone and then um, uh, our fertility doctors will uh, uh, allow the pregnancy to happen. Thank you, Guy. The, the last question for this evening or willing of the time, uh, is, do I understand you right that you do not offer testicular biopsy or for prepubertal bi boys? Uh, yes, Alessandra? Therapy, we offer it, but from a practical point of view, at least in Italy, we, we, we are not doing, but uh, it's also um, something really more complicated, more invasive. So if the adolescence is not too stressed about ejaculating, this can be an uh, easier option. I don't know if you want to add something to this or... No, I agree. I mean, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, still quite an experimental topic, and especially in those young people um, where the focus uh, at this point when they see us in clinic is not usually not uh, on fertility. So, I mean, we then have to motivate or sometimes maybe force people to, to take decisions and to take steps and I think, uh, and that's one of the problems, of course, that the timing is sometimes not right to send very young people uh, to the fertility center. But that's a very personal choice and decision, of course. And if uh, the child, uh, adolescent and parents are very motivated, that's something that we could pursue, uh, but it's rarely chosen. Yeah. yeah, I agree that adolescents are not really motivated to preserve fertility. So it's really hard topic to discuss with them and with the family. Okay, thank you again, uh, Jos, Guy, uh, Timo, Mude, Alessandra and Analu for an excellent presentation. So informative, uh, so easy to understand. Uh, um, and uh, from what I see from the comments uh, from the people on the chat and also in the answer, uh, people enjoy it. So thank you very much for uh, giving uh, us uh, this uh, uh, excellent uh, webinar. Um, uh, I'm sorry that we cannot answer all the questions on willing of the time uh, as we agreed also with the presenters. I just want uh, to stress again, um, we have the ESSM Congress that uh, you will get soon uh, specific details I know that a lot of people in uh, uh, the ESSM and around have some practical problems, some emotional problems, some ethical issues, certainly in this COVID period. So we arrange and support uh, uh, for people who have this uh, need. If you have question, go to our website. You will find the support uh, uh, button. You can send directly and mail to us and uh, one of our professionals uh, will uh, contact you and help you through or, or just give an advice through the mails. That's where we are for. Uh, so remember that. And I again uh, remind you for the upcoming uh, webinars that we have on the 3rd of June about sexual desire discrepancy uh, uh, with uh, uh, Marike De Vita and Alexander Sturhofer on hormonal contraception, uh, con 
contraception and female sexuality with uh, Stephanie Bott and Elisa uh, Mazzarelli. And uh, on the 16th of June by our president and Daniel Osmanov about the expectation and satisfaction concerning penal prosthesis implantation. On 18th of June, the use of cavernous nerve uh, injury models uh, uh, in ED after post radical prostatectomy and on 24th of June on energy based devices for female genital urinary indication. So stay with us, uh, stay with us on the website and on our uh, emails, uh, news mails to see on all the educational activities, but also to contribute and to stay with us in contact with the congresses and all the activities. And Thank you again for being with us and thank you again for our marvelous uh, faculty that uh, coordinate with each other uh, to uh, participate uh, in uh, this webinar. And I wish you, all of you, a uh, well and nice evening. And thank you very much for uh, sharing it with us. Good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Congratulations.